Thank you, Lisa, for the enthusiastic introduction. You know, when it comes to end of life, not everybody is always that enthusiastic. I've, had, I've been introduced many, many times, and Lisa does a good job for two reasons. Number one, she can say my last name, which is always a challenge. Number two, she's enthusiastic about this. You know, uh, uh, as a society, we don't like to talk about death that much. We avoid it at all costs. And one of my favorite introductions is a woman got up there, and she obviously fell in that camp, and she goes, and Dave's here to talk to us about death. I said, you know, why don't you say Dave's here to talk about colonoscopy? Dave's here to talk about the plague, you know? Uh, so, and Dave's here to talk about taxes, which interesting enough, that's why April 16th is National Healthcare Decision Day, because death and taxes are the two for sure things in our lives. So we got taxes on the 15th of April, so we rightly uh, came up with April 16th, let's talk about advanced directives. Uh, I am always excited. When Lisa said we're going to start at 8 o'clock in the morning, I have to confess to you right off the bat, I am a morning person, okay? And I apologize. How many people are like me? The rest of you are not yet. Well, I used to, when I was at Michigan State, I used to have people request they don't eat breakfast with them in a the dorm because I was too cheerful. So, so I'm going, I can't eat with them, I can't eat with them. I see a young lady sitting by herself. I plop myself down next to her. I say, hi, why if I have breakfast with you? And she's got a newspaper up here, and she goes, you can sit here, I'm probably not going to talk to you, and goes like that. I said, she needs me. I have found my purpose in life. <laughs> she didn't get up and walk away, so she must like me. And today, 44 years later, she talked to me this morning. Uh, so uh, I've got bad news and good news for you. The bad news is, last time I checked, we're all going to die. The good news is, is that at the end of life, statistically speaking, most of us are going to take, die a death that takes place over time. And we're going to know what we're dying of. And it gives us time to make some decisions. It's some time to make some choices. And because, you know, 100 years ago, childbirth, accidents, and infection were the number one leading causes of death. Today it's cancer and heart disease and the dwindles. My mom basically dwindled away at age 102. Okay, we're living longer. And so... Uh, as a Making Choices Michigan director said, sooner or later, there's going to be a conversation about your end of life. Don't you want to be part of it? I like that. You know, we can avoid it all we want, but sooner or later there's going to be that conversation. I want to be part of that conversation myself. I have the benefit, as they said earlier, I've been a hospice volunteer for over 30 years, but I also have been a Making Choices Michigan volunteer for the last eight years. And those two things are really a neat combination because I have seen in my hospice experiences both positive and negative ends of life. And I have seen, uh, and I've been able to translate that to uh, my Making Choices Michigan volunteer role when I go over and do advanced directives with people. I've uh, facilitated, like Andrea was saying, they'll do it for free, over 50 conversations with people and do, do their advanced directives. So I, I've seen people come to me and say, you know, this really worked well, I want it to do for me, or this didn't work well, I want to make sure that doesn't happen to me. So, Susan J Jacoby wrote a great book, Never Say Die. And in that book, she said there's four ways that we look at the end of life. Number one, do everything medically possible for me till the end of my, and, and last minute I breathe. Number two, do everything medically possible for me, and then when I can't make a decision, even though we've never had a conversation, you will magically know what I want and do that for me. Magical thinking, it's a great thing. Number three, plan ahead. Get an advanced directive, get a patient advocate, make my wishes known, distribute these things, and have conversations with people. And the fourth category is to artificially hasten death somehow. Think about that for a moment. Today, where would you fall? Which category would you fall in? That could change. From 10 years ago, it'll change 10 years from now. But think about that for a minute. That's what today's all about, thinking about what I want. There is no right or wrong answer. There's only the right answer for you. Somebody may make a totally different decision, your spouse or sibling or uh, coworker, that's fine. That's what works for them. The main thing is you thought about it, you had a conversation, and you took some action. Where we fall in those four areas, I think, uh, has to do with our attitude on life. To me, there's two attitudes on life. There's a straight, rigid, life is a line. I was born, I went to school, I got out of school, I got a job, maybe I got married, maybe I had kids, I retired. And way over there, on 31, is death. 
it's so far away, I can't even see it. And if I don't have to see it, I can't, don't have to think about it. And we avoid it at all costs. You know, uh, Woody Allen wrote a, a, a little, uh, had a saying, says, I'm not afraid of death, I just don't want to be there when it happens. I think that's the attitude. People and, uh, would say, you know, I remember my mother-in-law telling me her sister was dying in her 70s. Nobody told her she was dying because they wanted to, quote, spare her. I mean, how crazy is that? And then there's the circle of life. The circle of life is all the things that we just talked about happen in a circle. I was born, all those things, I come back and I die. It's been going on for eons and eons and eons in the animal world with humans and with uh, nature. Most of us lived on the farm 100 years ago. Remember the show, The Waltons? Do, 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 do. The older folks were like, yeah, yeah, I love that show, John Boy. Like, who, who, who lived on the farm with the Waltons? Grandma and Grandpa. And Grandma and Grandpa died there, too. It was all part of life. I remember my dad saying to me, I remember, anybody, you probably, there's a young crowd here today, remember a story about somebody, instead of being laid out in the funeral home, were laid out at their house? Anybody got that? You're not in your head. What was the name of that house, or the name of the room that the person was laid out in? Anybody remember? It was called the parlor. What do we call it now? We call it the living room. Politics isn't the only way we can spin things. We've taken this thing that was very intimate, very, you know, the body was right there in the house. People would come and uh, sometimes wash it and dress it. And now we've taken it away from that, renamed it the living room, and, call it, and then move it to the funeral parlor. It's one step away from ordinary life. There is a great movie out there called Departures. It's a Japanese foreign film. A guy answers an ad in the paper, and he thinks he's going to be a, uh, a travel agent. And he gets there, and it's an old Japanese guy who, in the tradition of the Japanese, the old way of doing things, he dresses body and bathes them when they die and helps the family with the, their ceremony right at the house. Don't confuse it with the movie Departed, which is also has to do with a lot of death, very violent death with Jack Nicholson uh, in, the, in the starring role. But it's interesting, I highly recommend it. Uh, Tuesdays with Maury, one of my all-time favorite books. He wrote, this is what we're all looking for, a certain peace with the idea of dying. If we know in the end that we can ultimately have that peace with dying, we can finally do the really hard thing, which is to make peace with living. It's natural to die. The fact that we make such a big hullabaloo over it is because we don't see ourselves as part of nature. We think because we're human, we're separate and we're special. We're not. Everything that gets born dies. Now here's the payoff. Here's how we are different from those wonderful plants and animals. As long as we love each other and remember the feeling of love we had, we can die without ever really going away. All the love you created is still there. All the memories are still there. You live on in the hearts of everyone you have touched and nurtured while you were here. And then he says one of my all-time favorite quotes from a book. Death ends a life, not a relationship. And how true that is. Going back to uh, you know, our, our uh, avoidance of death. I took out the obituaries a few weeks ago. I took 23 of the first obituaries. Only three of them say the person died, passed away, went to be with his Lord, went to her heavenly home, eternal rest, called home to be with the Lord, went home to be with her Lord and Savior. Everything except mentioning that they die. We die. It's okay. It's part of the deal. And once I think we accept that, I think we're better along in the game. There's another good book out there, Denial of Death, by Ernest Becker. And he says, everything we do in our life has to do with avoidance of the fear of death. Everything. Unconsciously, most of it. So, I got a couple stories. I got a lot of stories. Uh, having to do with the straight uh, uh, view of life. A friend of mine was not, had breast cancer. And she had it for 20 years, and it was in and out of remission. It was up, up, up like a roller coaster. And she went to the doctor, and the doctor said, there's nothing more we can do for you medically. I advise you to go home and get your affairs in order. I heard about that, and I went to visit her. And I'm always trying to reach out to people. And I said, you know, I understand the doctor said there's nothing more to be done. I said, how would you like to spend your last days? And she didn't hesitate. She says, I want to get better. And I said, but if you couldn't get better, I was really kind of, I thought a little bit on shaky ground here, how would you like to spend your days? And she goes, I want to get better. Fighting is all that she knew. 
She'd been battling breast cancer for the last 20 years, and that's all she wanted. And her husband called me that night and said, Dave, we appreciate you coming over. Do not mention the word hospice because she is nowhere near there. I'm nowhere near there. And I said, you know, my job here is to support you. It's not to, you know, even though I'm involved in hospice, it's not to try to get somebody to go to hospice. A week later, she ends up in the hospital, the last place she wanted to be. And she happened to be there that day, and her family was there. And she, she said, listen, come over to my bed. She says, here I am in the hospital. I never wanted to be here. She says, I waited too long to make a decision to deal with this. I'm going to die here. I know that. Don't make the same mistake I made. She died later that night. Very sad story. Then the circle of life revolves around my dad, Mal Camp Schulte. Mal was a big smoker, smoked camels in Chesterfields all his life. He was dying of emphysema. And he went to the doctor. The doctor says, Mal, there's nothing more we can do for you. And on the way home, I said the same thing I said to my friend. I said, Dad, I heard the doctor say that you have limited time. How would you like to spend that time? And he says, I don't want to be in a hospital. I don't want to be in a nursing home. I want my family and friends here. I want to die at home. I said, thank you. We can make that happen. But we never have really talked about it. It's really nice that we know that because now we have a plan. My dad was a huge planner. He had every minute of his day planned out. I knew that was important to him. I said, Dad, you always, always told us to have a plan. We're going to need a plan here. And part of that plan is going to involve hospice. If you want it, you die at home. So I said, let's get hospice over here. And we, you can ask them all the questions that you want. And they can sign you up. You don't have to use them right away. You know, they'll come when you need them, but it's one less thing to get out of the way because I have discovered when things start to go, it's not usually a slope like this. It's a point where it just falls off the cliff and things change so rapidly, all you're doing is reacting at that point. Planning doesn't do a whole lot of good at that point. You've got to plan ahead further down the road. My dad, and I said to my dad, because he never made a snap decision in his life, I said, Dad, why don't you think about it tonight? And I'll call you tomorrow morning. My dad was the kind of guy who, you know, he'd go to the store and say, is that going to be on sale later today? If I, if I come back at 4 o'clock, those vegetables, will there be a discount? I mean, he was always trying to, you know, make that. He would think a week before buying something over $10. That was just his personality, and I knew that. I called him up the next morning. He says, I think it's a good idea. Let's get hospice here. So hospice came, did their thing, and left. A week later, I'm helping up his two-story uh, flights of stairs to his bedroom. He goes, Dave, I think it's time to get hospice. We called hospice, and they were there the next morning with a bed, and they had already been there with oxygen. We had the back room cleared out because we knew that's where he was going to be. He got down that hospital bed, and I'll never forget the words he said to me. He said, I'm, this feels so good. I'm so tired. And right then, I knew that he just gave himself permission to die. All his life, he was a child of depression, World War II. He just put one foot in front of the other because that's all he knew and kept fighting. And he just said, I'm done. And, I, and uh, my mom, I said, my mom, I said, Mom, this is going to go really quick. And she says, oh, no, we got lots of time. You know, we can have family and friends over and look through photo albums. And Thursday, this was Thursday, on Friday, his adult grandchildren came over. And uh, he said to Mike, he said, Mike, he says, you know that bottle of whiskey you got me for Christmas? He says, I think it's a good time to to drink, break it open and have a drink. So they all had a drink with Grandpa. And the priest came the next morning, interesting enough, to do the last rites, being Catholic. That was important to him. He, goes, he walks in the room. My dad was in and out of consciousness at this point. And he goes, Melvin, Father John. My dad, I don't think my dad quite realized if he was still in this world or in another world or not. <laughs> but he had the last rites. I talked to the priest later. And he, I said, you know, you were pretty loud with him. He says, well, I, I have to be, because I have to sometimes bring him back. Keep that in mind. Uh, so on Monday morning, he died. It was very quick. My mom just was flabbergasted. It went so quick. But as soon as he sat down in that bed and said, I'm so tired, I knew that it was going to go quickly. So it's important when I have conversations with people, whether I'm doing advanced directors with them, whether I'm in my hospice role, to try to get as much information as I can. You don't mind pick, me picking on you, do you? Okay. You look like I'm kind of fun. It, This has nothing to do with death. I'm not going to embarrass you. Tell me your name. Barb. Barb. Metaphorically speaking, Barb, do you see yourself as a window or as a door? Window. Oh, and you are very definite. Why is that? I'm an open book. I'm open. I'm, opportunities are endless. Okay. And I know you 
saw how much fun Barb had. You want to do this too, don't you? <laughs> what, what, what's your name? I'm Tina. Tina. Metaphorically speaking, do you see your, and you don't get the same one. Do you, do you see yourself as a candle? I know you had it all worked out. Do you see yourself as a candle or a flashlight? Flashlight. Because? Shine around. Okay, the rest of you, I can't go around and ask everyone. You all were thinking in mind, how am I going to ask this? She said window. She said flashlight. What was the next word out of my mouth? What was the next word out of my mouth? Why? 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 They only give me a snippet. I, I, I need to ask them more. If for those of you, this is a younger crowd, but the older ones in the crowd, Paul Harvey comes out of Chicago at noon every day for a news broadcast back in the 60s. He'd go to commercial break, he'd come back, he'd say, Page two. Now for the rest of the story. And that's what I'm trying to do is get the rest of the story. We're programmed in our way we grow up, just give the answer. Don't give an explanation. And so why? Because help me to understand. Tell me more. Those are all invitations for people to get into the conversation. We have to invite people in the conversations, especially when talking about end of life because our society puts such a taboo on it. I'll give you a story. I had a guy, a uh, hospice patient one night. He was the most relaxed person I ever knew, just would sit back there and smile and tell me stories. And I got there about the fourth visit. He was just in his chair. He was fidgeting. He was going like this. So I said to him, because not always the words out of the mouth and what's going on, they always don't go together. If you ask me today, Dave, how are you doing? I go, Fine. That doesn't make sense. So I said, Wilbert, tell me what's going on. You look a little anxious tonight. He says, well, I am worried about something. I said, tell me. I'd like to hear it. He said, well, I've been married twice before, and both my wives have died. And I'm going to die pretty soon because I'm in hospice. I know that. And when I do die and go to heaven, <laughs> now, like you, I wanted to laugh right out loud because he was worried about who he's going to be married to. And, uh, and, uh, and so uh, it's important. What was funny to me was serious business to him. And that's lesson number one right there in listening to somebody. You can't put your values on what's going on. And uh, there's another one, a quote that I always put right here in the top of my head when I go into a room. The human soul doesn't want to be fixed. It just wants to be heard. I'm a fixer. I'm a problem solver. You got a problem? I'll fix it for you. That's, that's how my personality is. I just have to shut up and stay seated and let the person talk. And he figured, he talked it out. He didn't need me to help him. He's kind of disappointed in that. But uh, I, he figured out, you know, he's going to have the best of both worlds when he, when he died. And that is he chose. He's probably secretly giving thanks he wasn't married to three women. So, uh, but that is the getting the rest of the story. Fine. You ask me how I'm doing today, I'm going to answer fine. Because it's an acronym. Feelings inside not expressed. Feel, I can't take credit for it. I didn't come up with it, but I heard it at a workshop. I said, bing, that hits, the, that hits the ball on the head right there. Feelings inside, not expressed. I'm going to say, okay, good, or fine. Somebody asked me today, Dave, how are you doing? And in the morning, I'm usually pretty excited. The problem is I'm this way pretty much all day long. But, uh, and, and you could just see the eyebrows go up. He said, didn't you get the memo? You're supposed to say fine, good, or okay. And so that has to do with things. If you ask me how I'm doing, I say, I'm sad. It's like, I can't get out of the room fast enough. I can't deal with sad. Say, tell me you're fine. I need to hear that from you. Story about uh, following up and inviting somebody to the conversation. My aunt was in a rehab hospital. She had congestive heart failure. Her kids were out of town. I called them up. I said, would you like me to sit in to some of the medical consultations? They said, please, we really appreciate that. I went to the, and they said, Margaret, if you can just walk around the hallway, two more laps. Margaret, if you can just uh, uh, eat more for dinner. Margaret, if you can be on the treadmill for five more minutes, we can get back to your apartment. You know what Margaret said? I'm so tired. And I missed it. It went right over my head. You can see the market left right there. <laughs> and the staff missed it too. They th we all thought she had a bad night's sleep. And on the way home, I'm kind of mulling things over like I do after conversations with people. I said, my Margaret, you know, you think I'm enthusiastic. You should have seen Margaret. I mean, she was off the scale. And I said, that, that was not typical for her. I said to my wife, I got to go back after dinner and talk to her. So I get there at 8 o'clock, she's in her pajamas, it's bedtime. She goes, Dave, it's bedtime, what are you doing here? And I said, Margaret, I heard you say today that you were so tired. Help me to understand what you meant by that. She goes, I am tired. She goes, I don't want to fight anymore. I fought all my life, you know, I've been sick for such a long time. And her head's kind of down like this. 
And I said, Margaret, you don't have to fight if you don't want to. It's your choice. And her head just shot right up. She says, I don't? And I said, no, you don't. It's your choice what you do with your life. I said, have you talked to a doctor about your prognosis? And she says, can I do that? And at this point, my heart's just breaking. She's that generation. If I had a white coat on, she's not going to ask questions. She's not going to create waves. She's just going to do what she's told to do. And I said, you bet. We got the person in there the next day. And they said, Margaret, you have congestive heart failure. There's nothing more to do here, medically speaking for you. But he says, I know the hospice here in town similar to Poppin House, where it's an inpatient thing, you can go to stay because I know both your kids are out of town. And uh, she said, that sounds like a good idea. So we got the paperwork done, we're walking down the hallway, and uh, she, a lot of the people, if you had knowing about hospice, are in their last week of life. Uh, unfortunately, that's the way it is, and people are in their beds, and, and she's walking, she says, Dave, I don't belong here. Look at me, I'm walking down the hallway, these people are in beds. And I said, Margaret, trust me, this is where you belong. And she says, well, she says, as long as I'm going to be here, you know, with all this heart medication I've been taking the last 20 years, I have never had the chance to drink my Southern Comfort Manhattans. Do you notice a trend in our family? <laughs> <laughs> they like to toast the big events in life. So I said, you bet, we can do that. And uh, we played cribbage, told stories, and uh, two weeks later she had an event after getting the, uh, the last rites from the priest, and we walked out of the room, he walked in, we walked back in, and she was unconscious and she died right, right then. I said, if you're Catholic, dying two minutes after getting the last rites is not a bad way to go. But here's my question for you. My dad and his sister, in those four areas, you know, do everything medically possible for me and planning ahead, which one do you think they fell in? Which area did they fall in? Anybody want to take a stab? Which area? Most people would say they planned ahead. I would say, no, you know, I think that they probably fell in that area, do everything medically possible for me. Not because not necessarily that's what they wanted, but nobody ever had a conversation with them, so everybody says that's probably what's going to happen here. It took me to ask the question. It could have been anybody in this room, inviting them into the conversation. Once they were invited, they knew exactly what they wanted, and they were able to uh, articulate that. But because we don't like to talk about death or think about death, we're scared to hell of death, we don't do that, those kind of conversations. And to me, that's what today is about. You know, it's National Healthcare Day, and people think, oh, it's for, you know, for me to realize I need to come up with an advanced directive. And that's part of it. But you, know, you only die once. I only die once. People around us are dying all the time. And we're the kind of people, you're here today, that you're a caring person. You're gonna be involved in their death whether you probably want to or not. And to have this, be able to have this conversation with people, let them sort out what they're feeling. That's the important part of that. How many people here have an advanced directive? Raise your hand. I got news for you. You all should have your hands up in the air. You know why? Because you all do have an advanced directive by default. If something were to happen to you right now, and the 911 was called, they would whisk you off to the hospital, and they would do everything possible to keep you alive, because they're legally obligated to do that. People don't realize that. They think, oh, I don't need an advanced directive. You, know, uh, you, you do, otherwise that's the default. If that's what you want, that's fine. But if you don't want that, you may want to make some thoughts along the way, and there's different scenarios that we're going to talk about that. Part of all this conversation has to do also with, uh, you know, 70% of people say, I want to die at home. That sounds like a nice thing to do. You know, only 40% of the people die at home. There's some roadblocks there. What do you think the roadblocks are? What do you think the roadblocks are? Why so many people say, yeah, that's what I want, but only 40% actually do. They didn't tell anybody, okay? They didn't know they had options. They did not know they had options. What else? They don't know where they are in their life. They haven't been told. The medical community doesn't want to tell them because they're a little bit, uh, uh, you know, if I'm a doctor, my job is to save and keep people alive. If you die, what am I? I'm a failure. I didn't, I didn't do my job. And so they start thinking, well, you know, they, they, they want to, they, they're, They've come a long way, but there's still a big part of the medical community that says this is our job to do. 
A great book, right next to Tuesdays with, being, with Maury, is Being Mortal by Atu Gawande. Highly, highly recommend it. For those who don't like to read that much, they have YouTube clips of him talking, which is excellent. In the book, he says, my job, I was a surgeon. I am a surgeon. My job, I thought, was to keep people alive. He says, then my dad got sick. And it became personal. And I realized that's not my job. My job is to provide well-being how he wants to live his last days. And it's, a, it's, a, and it's a, a wonderful book because it talks about aging and it talks about end of life, two, two parts of the book. So the medical community is a problem. Anything else? Pardon me? Your family doesn't know, or maybe your family doesn't agree with you. It doesn't agree with you, yeah. I mean, you're, you don't want to have this confrontation about this, and so you, you, just go, you don't do it. We're huge procrastinators. And then, take my mother-in-law, please. <laughs> a little drum roll there. I get a call from her one day, and she goes, Dave, she goes, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah, Lynn, where are you? She goes, I'm out in the backyard. And I can see the cord, this is before cell phones are out the slider door. And I said, well, Lynn, why, why are you whispering to me? And she goes, your father-in-law has the big C. And she, she came from that generation, if you use the word cancer, you might die quicker. I know it's crazy, but this was crazy times. And I said, does he know he has cancer? Yes. I said, well, get, get him back in the house and go back and let's put him on the speakerphone and talk about it. He had stage four kidney cancer. He kind of kept it from the family. And uh, I said, well, Russ, as you're talking to me about this, it sounds like you know, it's an opportunity for hospice. Have you thought about that? And she came in right away. No, no, it's not time for hospice. All right, here's your cue. What's the next word out of my mouth? Why? I, where is this coming from? She says, because my sister did not, uh, did not come into hospice until she, uh, the last week of her life. And I said, why was that? She says, because she was in pain. She says, Russ is not in pain yet. It's not time for hospice. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh. But that's a really good lesson because it's very important for me when I'm having a conversation with somebody to say, what is your concept of A, your diagnosis? B, what is your concept of hospice? The other one thing I hear from people, I hear one of two things from people that don't know anything about hospice and people that do know something about hospice. People who do know say, it's wonderful. We had it for our family. I plan on having it for me. I, what do you think the people who don't know anything about hospice say? It's what you do when you're going to die. It's giving up. It's giving up. And you know, hospice is not, it's comfort rather than cure. It's not giving up. It's, it's all about to getting guidance at the end of life. We don't, like I said earlier, we only die once. Hospice is involved with death all the time. They can predict you know, not minute by minute, but, but stages, what's going to happen and help guide the family. My best friend died, and uh, the hospice nurse, I'll never forget, said to me, she says, remember, all the senses don't go at one time. The last senses, the sense to go is hearing. Don't talk to your, uh, about your friend when you're in the room with him, and please do talk with him because he knows you're even there, even though he may be unconscious. It's very important to let him know he's not alone. And then another time, uh, in the last uh, hours of his life, he, the, his uh, trachea was closing down and the air was rushing out at a, a constricted level, a high speed. If you've ever, it's called a death rattle. It's not a very pleasant sound, but it's very natural. But we didn't know that. We said to the nurse who was there, said, do something, he's in pain, he's in all kinds of pain, you gotta help him. And we're starting to panic. And she very calmly says, this is a natural occurrence. There's no pain involved here, it's okay. Wow, what a relief. That's what hospice can do. So the, uh, the other roadblock along the way is the obituaries. When the newspaper used to be, ironically, we're in the Chronicle, used to be published seven days a week, the paper would come to our house, my, dad, uh, my mom would go for the front page, I'd go for the sports page, my dad would go for the obituaries. He knew everybody in Grand Rapids, and uh, he was really important for him. I'll never forget to say, Dorothy, we gotta go to Alts tonight, funeral home, and say goodbye to so-and-so. And when my dad went to the funeral home, it wasn't, Andy, I'm sorry for your loss, you know, and move on down the road. It was, he stayed there for an hour, hour and a half telling humorous stories about this person and the impact that he had on his life. It was his way to grieve. It was his way to try to make the people feel better, to realize that their loved one had an impact. When my dad died, people came to his wake and they said to me, they said, we sure enjoyed having your dad come to our family wakes. He always made us feel good about that. That was his way of doing it. But, 
The obituary, let's, let's, let's uh, see if you can finish the sentence for me. Dave, age 66, died after, fill in the blank for me. After, a, a what? What kind of battle? What kind of battle? Courageous battle. A long, courageous battle with cancer. Hey, that sounds pretty good. I kind of want that in my obituary, you know. Do, do you know why that's in there? You never see it for heart failure or something else. It's because we're at war with cancer. President Nixon in 1971 declared war. Cancer, if you have a war, you need warriors. And part of that warriors, I, it's, it, I have all the respect in the world for anybody who's ever gone through chemo or radiation fighting cancer. But, you know, it's, the other side of that coin is Dave gave up and died, went to hospice and died. Maybe there's a medium ground. Dave realized his impending death was coming. He uh, sought the care of hospice and was surrounded by family and friends. Once again, that, uh, we spin things in a way. I want that long, courageous battle, you know? It's a different way of looking at things. John Wayne's a problem, too. John Wayne. Why is John Wayne a problem? Here's, you think of John Wayne, you think of a tough, macho cowboy. Okay? And you never see John Wayne ask for help. You never see him cry. You never see him express emotions. And we think we all have to be like John Wayne. Don't, don't ask for help. Well, I'll tell you, when you're at the end of life, just like at the beginning of life, we all need help. And it's okay to ask for help. I'm telling my class this. So she was telling, I, I taught East Grand Rapids. Hand goes up one day. You know what the question is? Who's John Wayne? <laughs> oh, I said, okay, part of being a teacher is you've got to think on your feet. Think of Bruce Willis in Die Hard. Yeah. They, they, could, they, got, they got that. So those are all roadblocks to why 70% say they want to die at home, 40% say they don't. Tell me, what was your definition of a good death? What is your definition of a good death? In my sleep. In your sleep. Okay, forget being in your sleep and forget hitting a hole in one on the golf course, okay? What is your definition of a good, good, good death? Family with you. Family with you. Now, you, that sounds like a logical thing, right? But it's interesting, because I have many experiences with hospice. Not everybody's family is like mine. I've had people say, my son Tom can come at 6, my daughter Mary can come at 4. They can't be in the same room at the same time. I don't want them in there, OK? What else is the definition of a good death? Painless. Painless. Now, Andy, are we talking emotional pain or physical pain? Yes. yes. <laughs> but most people think physical pain when they say that, OK? And, uh, and, and a lot of us carry around a lot of regrets in our lives, okay? We have experiences from our past that we haven't dealt with, and I tell you, you wait to the last. That's one thing about Maury. Maury, I said, always had a clean plate because he dealt with this stuff. If you, if you wait to the last, the plate's going to be pretty empty or pretty full at the end. Anything else about a good death? My father-in-law took me. He said, Dave, he said, let's go for a walk. He takes me down to the basement. He said, Dave, he said, here's the circuit breakers. Dave, here's the gas shut off. Dave, here's the water shut off. Dave, here's the file with all my taxes and legal stuff. Typical guy stuff, very pragmatic person. He knew his wife correctly, knew nothing about this. It gave him peace to know that I knew this stuff and I could carry it out. My mother, on the other hand, liked the minutia of life. She wanted everything planned out. A lot of people like to plan her funerals. She was one of those people. And she said, uh, you know, I don't know what to do. I got... Six pallbearers I got to fill for the casket. I got five male grandchildren because, you know, it's got to be a guy. And I said, Mom, she says, I don't know what to do with that last spot. I said, Mom, you got a great grandchild. She goes, he's so scrawny, he couldn't carry a person. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, Mom, just hang out a few more years. He's growing every day. Six years later, Mom dies. Brandon could carry the whole casket by himself. That was important for her, to have that conversation with me. We talked about this stuff all the time. Acceptance of death is huge to, of a good death. My mom, at uh, 102, uh, she had a stroke. She couldn't swallow. We'd had this conversation many times. She had an advanced directive laid out. She said she was bemoaning the fact three days earlier she was at a retirement community, and she says, I'm paying taxes on my house because we didn't sell the house, and I'm paying for upkeep here. I says, I, I, and she said it was irritating her because my mom was rather frugal. And uh, cheap might be the better word for it. But anyways, so I said, Mom, we can always sell the house. She goes, no. Her finger comes out. She goes, when it's my turn to die, I want to go home. Four days later, she has a stroke. We bring her home. And the priest comes over to give the last rites, different priest. And he's making small talk with the family. 
And uh, she says, uh, uh, Father, you are here to give me the last rites, aren't you? And, uh, and he says, well, yes, Mrs. Gamp, Shelty, I am. She goes, let's get going. I'm in a hurry. And my mouth just dropped. My mom was so proper around priests. I mean, and then he goes, the standard response, Mrs. Camp Schultz, I'm sure God has other plans for you. And still has other plans for you. And she said, Father, listen to me. I'm 102 years old. I've lived a great life. All, everybody I know is dead. My family is here with me this week. My house is alive again with people. It's okay if I die. Acceptance of death. Okay? She accepted it. The other part of a uh, uh, good death is having your wishes made known. Have an advanced directive. It doesn't pay just to go fill out this stuff and never and shove it in a drawer and don't tell anybody. That doesn't work. My, a friend of mine called me up and said, my dad called me and says, Kathy, you're going to be my advanced uh, patient advocate. Goodbye. She called him back up and said, Dad, if I'm going to be a patient advocate, we're going to have a conversation about this. Oh, you know, we've talked about this over the years. You always go, oh, no, what I want. Goodbye. She calls him back up the third time. The second time, and says, Dad, if I'm going to be your patient advocate, you're meeting me for breakfast at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, and we're going to talk about this. That's what you want with a patient advocate. You want somebody who's going to fight for you. It does not have to be a family member. Somebody over 18. You want somebody who can make tough decisions under emotional circumstances. Because end of life often is emotional. And the other thing about that is you want somebody who's going to be your patient advocate who's going to fight for you even though they may totally disagree with your choices. I've had people say to me in these conversations with Making Choices in Michigan, I could never be a patient advocate. I could never make that decision. And I said, listen to me. You don't have to make the decision. Your parent or whoever is making that decision for you so when they can no longer make a decision for themselves, you kick in. And it's not, a, 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 and then somebody says, well, you know, I want my son and daughter to both be my patient advocate. I said, this is not a democracy. This is a dictatorship. It's going to be one person is the primary patient advocate. We have several spots for backups in case they can't do it or they can't be reached or whatever the case may be. It's, but only one person gets to handle that role. Finding that person who is going to be fight for you is the best thing you can do for a patient advocate. And they only do it when you can no longer make a decision for yourself. And what, what a gift. I th I've seen turmoil in so many families. They don't know what to do. I had a person come up to me crying after a speech, t tears rolling down her. She says, my dad died. He left nothing as far as what he wanted done afterwards. We had to make a decision. And she said, and we had a funeral for him. We had him buried. And she says, three weeks later, we're cleaning out his closet. And we come back to this metal safety box. And everything, five-page document, everything that he wanted. She says, why I'm crying today? She says, we did everything exactly the opposite of what he wanted. He wanted to be cremated. We buried him. He didn't want to have a service. We had a big blowout service. I feel terrible. But what are you going to do? you got to have the conversation. And that's the most important part. It's not filling out the form. That's key to doing that. And you have to have, the, the, the Michigan, the biggest thing is having a patient advocate. That's the number one. This person has to sign saying that they are responsible and they accept the role for this. And if they don't sign it today, they're going to sign it in the ER if you end up in, if you end up in the hospital. Sooner or later, they're going to have to sign it. So uh, in having the conversation, I always ask people, I said, tell me about your experiences with death in your life. What was that like? What did you learn from it? It's interesting. People say one of two things. So-and-so, my grandparents were very prepared, and they had an advanced directive, and they, we all knew what they wanted. They died at home, and that's what they wanted. I've had other people say, we just ended up in the ER. We didn't know what to do. There was no prior conversation. Uh, it, it's, it was terrible. And they go, that's why I'm here today. I don't want that to happen to me. Andrea and Lisa both said it's really important that even if you're over 18, everybody should have an advanced directive. Do you know why it's important? Do you all in here thinking, hey, I'm pretty young. I got my whole life ahead of me. When you think of dying, you think of people with maybe stage four cancer. But let me give you three names. Karen Ann Quinlan, Nancy Cruzan, and Terry Shavel. Anybody ever hear of them? They're the poster women for advanced directives because they were all young women in their 20s and 30s who had an event 
they had a stroke, they were in a car accident, and they had no advanced directive, and there were huge court battles over whether they should get fed, whether the breathing tube should be removed. It, it was terrible. And that's, that could happen to any of us the minute we walk out this door today. So that's why it's important when you're young to have an advanced directive. It's not people just dying of old age. You're thinking Dave's dying, he's going to be dead in a couple of years, and I got my whole life lived here. But that's not the case. Events are a huge part of this. And having this conversation, filling out the form, and then saying, I'm going to distribute this to different people. I'm going to distribute it to my doctor. I'm going to distribute it to my uh, person who's my patient advocate. I'm going to distribute it to my, uh, uh, if I have a lawyer of that situation. My mom had it on her refrigerator because she, we didn't know who was going to be the first person in the house. We had a big yellow piece of paper, Dorothy's advanced directive, and has, because you just never know who's going to be first. In her case, she was living by herself. There's an old story about a nurse in England. She had a tattoo put on her chest. It says DNR. She had another tattoo on her back that said, turn me over. She wanted to make doubly sure of that, what was going to happen here. Anybody, this is kind of a, a lot of ground to cover. Anybody have any questions or, that are coming up as I'm talking here? Any, or experiences that you would, would like to share to say that you know, Dave's full of beans or Dave's making sense here? It's important to review your advanced directive. They call it the five Ds. Death, diagnosis, divorce, decade, and decline. Those are the five things. It's just, we live in a checklist society. Oh, I filled this out, I'm done. Well, I had a, a woman raise her hand, I was saying this. She just blurted right out loud in the audience. Oh my gosh, I said, what's the matter? She goes, I just realized my patient advocate died five years ago. You gotta review this stuff. I had another client from Making Choices Michigan. He says, my wife and I are divorced right now, we're still pretty, on good, pretty good terms, but she says, I don't, I don't think I want her for my patient advocate anymore. I want to change that. Makes sense to me. Here's where I was 10 years ago, and this is what I believed 10 years ago, but now my life has changed a little bit. You know, I've got this diagnosis, and I'm kind of concerned about, you know, about things, how they might go, and I might get in, end up in a hospital very quickly, where before I didn't think that was going to happen, and I want to change some things around. These, it's important to review this stuff, to go over it. This, my, my, like I go back to my mom. My mom and I talked about this stuff all the time, you know, because it was on her mind. She wanted to be prepared. And, I, and both my mom, my dad, and my father-in-law died in home in hospice care where they wanted to die. I was able to help facilitate that through A, my hospice experience, but B, the fact that I was willing to reach out and invite them into the conversation. Because they all, my, my father-in-law was just gonna not even tell the family had stage four cancer. And it's, now some other things in addition to that is, in a, a, the most important thing is to have a patient advocate and say, A, here are the three choices. Do everything possible for me. C, don't do anything for me, and B, after several weeks in doctor's consultation, the doctors say I can't come back to who I was, please uh, let me go naturally. I've done over 50 of these conversations, and every single person has picked option B. Let's try it for a while, let's see what the doctors say, and then go from there. You can't, you can't say, well, after 62 days and five hours, you know, if I'm not who I am, we'll, you know, we'll change things. There's a great Seinfeld episode out there about Jerry. Uh, and Kramer, and Kramer is trying to figure out how uh, to fill out an advanced directive. I, I highly recommend seeing that. So those are all things to keep in mind as far as advanced directives go. Uh, the other thing, how much time do I have, Lisa? Okay, okay, thank you. Make sure I get, is uh, Susan Black, in, her, uh, in the book, uh, Being Mortal, said she's developed a set of questions that she asks patients. She also always starts off by saying, I'm sorry we're meeting under these circumstances. I wish things were different. But they're not different, so we're going to talk about this. A, what is your concept of your diagnosis? A lot of people will say, oh, you know, I'm going to get up and play golf next uh, summer. You know, it, it's just a, a minor setback. 
or they will say, I know I'm going to be dying soon, I have terminal cancer, da da da. The other th question, she says, what are your fears about dying? If I went around this room, everybody would say I have a different fear. Sometimes I'm, I'm fearful for my family, that they're going to be able to survive without me. Sometimes I'm, I'm fearful of experiencing pain. I'm experienced of coming to grips with the emotional pain in my life. And uh, there's all types of different fears. It's important to investigate these fears and talk about because sometimes once again, unless you hear the rest of the story, you don't know what they are and, and how to address them. It's very really important to do that. The other thing is, is how would you like, what's important to you in your life? What gives your life quality? I've had a couple, uh, we're filling out advanced directive, the guy says, I am a reader. He says, I've got a special reading light by my bed, I've got 20 books constantly piled by my bed. If I could not read, my life would be severely diminished. His wife in the same breath said, I'm a gardener. You know, I, if I couldn't guard, my life would be diminished. What's important to you? And then what type of care would you like to receive? And so some of the stuff wound in with this is uh, additional things like CPR. You watch movies and TV shows. What do you walk away with about the concept of CPR? Always works. Always works. You know, they bought me, I'm, I'm back up and I'm ready to go. I breathe it and pump it on my chest. Interesting statistic. I didn't know this until I went through the training for Making Choices Michigan. In a hospital setting, 48, or excuse me, 18% of the people who have an event in a hospital and are resuscitated by CPR come back to their normal cells. 18%. And that's in a hospital, and that's if you're healthy. That just blew me away. That made me really think about CPR, why they want that, because it's lack of oxygen is the, is the problem here. And uh, so that was one thing. Uh, the other thing is uh, to uh, whether you, how you, you know, some people, do I want to be buried? Do I want to be cremated? There's actually a third option. You know what the third option is? It's called a green burial. They're saying that cremation, it still gives off fumes and all that kind of stuff and chemicals. If they're going to put you in a shroud or a cardboard box or a, a plywood box and put you in the ground with no vault or anything, I won't go into the details of cemeteries today, but... Uh, uh, and you're just going to compost naturally, and you're going to feed the soil. And there's a place out here in Granville uh, that, that you can do that with. So it's a, you know, what, what is it that you want? Some people like to know. My mom was one of those people, wanted to have everything planned out. Other people, a, a friend of mine, a woman raised her hand, she says, I don't care what happens to me. I'll let my kids decide. She says, what do you think about that? And I says, well, I think it's your choice, and that's what you want to do. That's fine, but you have to also realize that's going to have an effect on your kids because in a moment of anguish and emotion, they're going to have to make some decisions that you could have spared them that by doing this. Also, people say, I don't want a service. I've had people say that to me, and I, I want that written down. No service, no nothing. And it sounds clean. It sounds like no hassle. It sounds like no cost. We, as survivors, need to grieve. We need to remember. We need to tell the story. It's important for us to do that. I, I always, you know, back when my dad died, we had two days of visitations, night, afternoon and evening, uh, and, and then the funeral the, the, the third day. I mean, that was just common. You don't see hardly that anymore. Sometimes you see a visitation an hour before the service, and that's hard sometimes because so many people are there to, to, to have, take the time with that. It's uh, I, a friend of mine says, my mom doesn't want anything. I don't know what to do. I said, listen, why don't you call your family together after she dies, have a big dinner, get out the photo albums, and tell stories about your mom. And that's what they did. That was their service. Services take a lot of different ways. They're there. Uh, the other thing with uh, Susan Bach is she says, what, what are you willing to trade off? What are you willing to trade off? And, I, she, and people say, what do you mean? Well, as a, friend, a doctor friend of mine said, there's always one more thing we can do medically. The question you have to ask yourself is, what's the effect of that one more thing? Do I want to live six months longer and be tied to my bed throwing up and all, all the stuff that goes on sometimes with chemo radiation, or do I want to die in two months earlier but be free of that? There's a trade-off. In the book, Gwandi has a patient, and he says, doctor, he says, I want to know whether to have this surgery or not. And, uh, he says, he says, can you guarantee me that after surgery, I'm going to be able to watch NFL football on Sundays and drink, eat chocolate ice cream? He says, yeah, I can guarantee that, pretty much. 
let's have the surgery. What are the trade-offs you're willing to do? There's always one more thing to do. Interesting enough, Grand Rapids, and I'm sure Muskegon Falls in this, uh, with West Michigan, is rated the number one place to die in the United States. Didn't know that, did you? Well, I'm going to move to Grand Rapids so I can die. Here's how they know that. Number one, people who go, average hospice stay in Grand Rapids is 48 days. Nationally speaking, it's 20 days. I was talking to my nephew, his dad was dying, uh, he was divorced from my sister, and I said, you know, it sounds like maybe a hospice. No, no, it's not, no, no, that's not hospice. What's the next word out of my mouth? Why? Because hospice in his mind was only for the last week of life. Totally false. You can be in hospice care uh, with a six month diagnosis and that doesn't mean on six months and one day they kick you out, they, re they uh, reevaluate you and see where you are. So also, the number of days in the ICU. The ICU uh, has significantly lower days in Grand Rapids versus nationally speaking. That tells you that people are getting the word, they're getting time to make a decision. You say, I, maybe I don't want to go to the ICU. So that's an important part too. Making Choices Michigan was based on uh, 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 initially in La Crosse, Wisconsin. 96% of the people who die in their medical facilities in La Crosse, Gunderson, have an advanced directive. I mean, that's way above the average. I mean, the average is like 40%. So it's part of the culture. It's, part, it's okay to come to talks like this. It's okay to laugh about death. It's okay to you know, question, have conversations. That's just part of the culture because they realize that how important this is. Now, for those of you that remember Obamacare when it first came out, there was a part of Obamacare about having a conversation at end of life Anybody remember what that was labeled as? Death. death panels. And people went nuts over it. And they said, I want a death panel deciding when I die. It was taken out of the original act. Interesting enough, a couple years ago, it got put back in the act. Because people realized the value of having a conversation, paying up somebody in the uh, doctor's office to have it with you so people can be prepared. All these things make a difference. So, any thoughts or reflections before I close about what we talked about today? Yes, Andy? Um, you, you, had, you said 50 of these conversations. Do you then uh, encourage people to then go have the conversation with their doctor? You mentioned the doctors now are there. Well, there's a couple things I encourage. Number one, Andrea talked about Great Lakes Health Connect. You can upload these things to the web. And wherever I am, people will have your advanced directive. If I'm driving around, I'm in Traverse City getting a car accident, they're scratching my head saying, who's this guy? Type in my name, my advanced directive comes up, here's who you contact. And so I encourage people to go do that with Great Lakes Health Connect. I definitely encourage, most people when they have this conversation said, I gotta have this conversation with my kids. Here's the funny thing. Older people say, I wanna have this conversation my kids don't want to hear about it. And so I go to your, uh, the kids, I say, your parents really want to have this conversation with you. And they go, no, 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 we can't, we can't do that. Why? Because somebody, you know, they're going to get emotionally upset. They're going to start crying. I said, we've invented Kleenex. We got that handled. Let's have the conversation. Around you know, holidays, Making Choices Michigan has a logo that says, let's talk turkey. The, th the family is together at Christmas and Thanksgiving. Let's talk turkey. I like that. So yeah, I find that most people, I definitely encourage them to, most people on their own say, I gotta have this conversation with other people in my family. My husband's not here today. Any other questions, thoughts, reflections? Yes? I'd like to share um, a little story if I can. Sure. But my sister was diagnosed with cancer at 46 years old. And um, as soon as she was diagnosed, we started making the plans, getting the advanced directive getting what her wishes were in place. And I can't tell you what a significant change that was. I think she knew that my mom would be too emotional to handle making the decisions that she didn't want to feed do when it came to that point. She was given six months, she had terminal cancer. She didn't want to feed do. She didn't want to be intubated. If it came to that point, she wanted to go and go naturally without like prolonging um, 
things in her in any way, shape, or form. <clears throat> the day we got the call from the hospital that it was time for my sister, she had been on a BiPAP machine for five days. They normally only keep you on a BiPAP for two or three days. They called and said we have to make a decision right now because we can't keep her on this anymore. So to take her off of that meant to intubate her. My mom was there at the bedside saying, I know my daughter doesn't want to die because her emotions, it's her daughter, right? Nobody wants to lose a child. My daughter doesn't want to die. We can't just let her go. And I, had, I was able to sit down with my mom and say, Mom, this is what Laura put writing. This is what Laura put This is what she did. It made all the difference in the world. It just made all the difference in the world. It gave my mom peace to know that, okay, I get it now. Um, still hard to lose a daughter. Still hard to lose a sister at 47 years old. But it was there. And the right decisions were made based on what she wanted. Thank you for your personal story. That really helps illustrate what we're talking about today. And you're right. When crunch time comes, the emotions want to rise to the surface with that. Yes? Uh, my great grandma just had a stroke. She has no advanced directive. She can't talk. She can't move. She's paralyzed in half her side. She's not very responsive. But my grandma and her sister don't really understand what the doctors are saying. And they're just saying we need to keep her alive. So she's been in the ICU for two weeks. And now they're in the hospice care. And she'd bring her home to Georgia. And my grandma's going to quit her job and just stay home and take care of her. And it's good that she's coming home to hospice, but a lot of that, you know, would have been easier on the family if there had been some type of advanced directive. Thank you for sharing that. Gwandi makes the uh, uh, example in his book. He says, you know, you always hear about this person who had pancreatic cancer, life, average life expectancy is six months, who's lived for six years. And you think, I, I, I want to be that person. I'm, I'm going to be that person. I'm going to fight. I'm going to beat those odds. And he has a great line. In fact, in fact, that's the byline of his book. Hope is not a plan. Hope is not a plan. We all hope for that. But the, statistically speaking, it's not going to be us. I'd like to close with a book. You know, I started doing this talk. I, in my uh, class at East Grand Rapids, I had a death and dying unit. The kids are all going, oh, we don't want to talk about that. At the end of the semester, evaluations came back. It was their number one favorite unit because they realized it was about living. We used Tuesdays as Mori as a jumping off point. So I started doing this talk based on my hospice experiences. People said, you know, can, can you give us some handouts? I want to, and then people started saying, can you, gosh, the handouts are enough. Can you, can you give us more? So I ended up writing this little book. I'm dying to talk with you. It's not that big. But it's, it's a resource. I find what happens is that Lisa will read it tonight, and then she'll give it to Andrea. Andrea says, you know, some of my neighbor is going through some time. They might be helpful. And then it just gets passed. Next time I see it, it's all earmarked and torn and everything. And that's what I wrote it for, to be passed around. But I'd like to read a, uh, an excerpt from the last pages here. Despite the fact that I'm a strong advocate of hospice, will use it myself when my time comes, my goal in writing this book is not to get you to use hospice. My goal is to help you see you have choices when it comes to end-of-life care and to encourage you to consider these choices rather than blindly follow a path that you might not want to be on. I have seen where that path can lead, but I do not wish that on anyone. Regardless of what your wishes are for your own end-of-life care, it's likely you'll be called on to help a loved one as they face the same decisions, or you might be called upon to serve as a medical advocate for, uh, for someone. Even if you want to think about your own end-of-life, chances are you're going to be involved in somebody else's. I think back to my friend Phil and how the uncertainty and fear we faced together with his terminal diagnosis was replaced by a sense of calmness and an attitude of preparation through the help of many, many people. That is my hope for you. When the knock sounds on the door, I hope you answer it both for yourself and for others. Thanks for coming today. Thanks for uh, being willing to discuss this, these kinds of things. And uh, anybody that's interested, the books are $10. I have a business card there. As you can tell, I love to talk, especially in the morning. And uh, Lisa, thanks so much for inviting me. Okay.